so generous to spend your time with us tonight and to enrich beyond measure our collective conversation about your wonderful memoir. Please join me all in welcoming to Bates distinguished author and our main neighbor, Monica Wood. Thank you so much, Clayton. That was a beautifully written introduction, and I, I really appreciate it very much. I've had such a nice time today at Bates. What a welcoming, warm place this is. I've met with students, one from Rumford, uh, which was just a real treat, uh, and with some faculty, and we had a beautiful dinner at Clayton's house that she made all by herself. Um, it was just a, a wonderful time, so I thank you, Bates, for welcoming me, and I also want to thank Kirk Reed for being my, uh, my pal today and for helping me get here and set everything up. You've been great. So um, the book, of course, is called When We Were the Kennedys, a memoir from Mexico, Maine. And I, but I want to begin with a, a little story about my trip to Ireland this summer. As you know from reading the book, I have an Irish bloodline, both sides all the way back. But I have never been to Ireland and never had a particular yearning to go there. But I was on the road a lot and uh, my husband decided this summer we were going to take a real trip. And he had this big romantic notion that he wanted to take me back to my homeland. And so I said, well honey, that's a really nice idea, but to tell you the truth, I've always kind of felt French. <laughs> <clears throat> Why don't we go to France? Uh, and, but he would have none of it. So we did go to Ireland, which was a, a wonderful trip. We were actually on a houseboat for a couple of weeks, just the two of us, um, navigating the Shan Aran waterway. It was a lovely trip. And on our last night there, <clears throat> we were in a pub, as you do in Ireland. That's what you do every night. And we were in a place called Brogan's. It's in Ennis, Ireland, which is just uh, north of Shannon, where we were leaving the next morning. And we got there, got our Guinness, went up to the bar, and it was packed. And the places we had been along the river were tiny little pubs, much smaller than even this front part of the room. But this place was pretty big. There were probably 90 people in the pub. It was shoulder to shoulder. And we couldn't find a place to sit. And finally, this lovely older gentleman named Dick O'Connell said, well, come and sit with me, will ya? And so we went and sat with him. And I had the same conversation with Mr. Dick O'Connell that I had had with every single person I met in Ireland. Now, where are you from? And I said, well, we're from the States, from the state of Maine. Oh, Maine, Maine. Now, that's north of Boston, is it? And I said, yes, it is. It's north of Boston. I have a sister in Chicago. Do you think you might know her? <laughs> I said, well, Chicago is actually kind of a long way from Maine, but you, know, you never know. It's a small world. Are there any O'Connells in Maine? And this is the conversation you have over and over. They love their, their American connections. So we went through all of that rigmarole, and there was a little group of people doing traditional music as they do, uh, not on a stage or anything, but just kind of over in a corner. There was a fiddle and a concertina and a guitar. And he says to me, well, now, and I found out later that this guy was the self-appointed mayor of music in Ennis. He says, well, now, I have to apologize for the music this evening. And I said, well, no, it's, it's, we're really enjoying it. It's wonderful. He says, well, now, normally we have these fellas who come up from Shannon, best musicians you'll ever hear in Ireland, but apparently this evening they've brought in the substitutes. <laughs> I said, well, the substitutes are doing a fine, fine job. Do you like to sing, do you, he says to me. And I said, well, sure, I like to. Who doesn't like to sing? Yeah, I like to sing. He looks at my husband and says, and you, fella, you like to sing, do you? And Dan says, well, yeah. So he stands up with his Guinness, grabs a spoon, clink, 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 the entire bar, dead quiet. And he says, we've some people here from Maine who'll give us a song. <laughs> so I said, no, really, that's quite all right. Well, once you start something in Ireland, there is no getting out of it. So my husband, who is basically, you know, a wasp, but turned Irish the second he set foot on Shannon soil. He says, oh, sure, we'll give you a song. We'll give you two. So we walk up there. 
he, he borrows a guitar from one of the musicians and we sang, we think, okay, what's the oldest song we know? Because it's all about traditional music. So we sang a song called Cold Tattoo, which is an old coal mining song from the 30s, I think. And of course the place, it, it's a very low bar. I mean, you do anything and they clap and yell. And, and, so they were, and so then my beloved, who had brought me to my homeland, leaves me up there with a guitar and scurries back to his seat and says, sing hard times. And I don't know if any of you know hard times, but it's an old song, a Civil War era song from Stephen Foster, who was a great American songwriter in the mid 1800s. And uh, so I said, well, okay, I'll do it. So I, the chorus of this song goes like this. It's a song, a sigh of the weary, hard times, hard times, come again no more. Many days have you lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more. So I sing the first verse and I sing the chorus and about maybe five or six people are singing along and I thought, well, they know the song over here. Well, they didn't. They're just learning it as they go. I sing the second verse. Second time around the chorus, maybe 25 people are singing with me. And then the third and last time I sing the chorus, the entire pub is singing in unison with me. And there is something about a room full of people singing in unison that can fill the heart like no other thing. And I, I, I was just melting into my shoes. It was really an amazing moment. And at that moment, I finally made the connection between this country that I'd never been to and the little place in Mexico, Maine, where all of our music and our storytelling and my father's lilting accent, it just made perfect sense to me, that line from one place to another. And I'm thinking to myself, France schmantz. <laughs> These are my people, <laughs> which is really a way of getting to the book. The book is a family story, and as I said to a group today, a family story is about heritage, and it doesn't necessarily mean bloodlines. It means that first family that we have that follow us through the rest of our lives, whether we want them or not, they are ours forever. And it's about all of the things that inside our family, the rituals, the tradition, the religion, the um, family holidays, the, the way we speak to each other, the expressions, all of those things go into a family story. And sometimes they come from places we've never even been. So with this book, When We Were the Kennedys, um, I, I have to say it started, I, I kind of backed into writing it. I had no intention of doing memoir. It's not something that was ever on my radar. But I was at a book event one time with, a few years ago with Wes McNair, who is our poet laureate. And I don't know if any of you have ever met Wes. He's a lovely, lovely man, an older gentleman, very tall, like seven feet tall or something, with a kind face. And he asked me if I would write an essay for a anthology that he was putting together called A Place Called Maine, 24 Writers on the Maine Experience. So he asked me very nicely, I need something, I've got a lot of stuff from the coast, I have Kathy Pelletier has the county covered, but I need something from what I call rural inland industrial Maine, with all those mill towns along the rivers. So I very nicely said, you know Wes, I'm really a novelist, I have no interest in writing memoir style things, so I'm sorry, but I have to say no. So he looks at me with that very kind face and he says, I understand completely and I need it in two weeks. <laughs> so I went home and started writing this essay and I thought, how do you write about something so huge as the place you're from? That place that no matter where you live in the world and the rest of your life, you will never not be from there. So I decided to approach it the way I would approach a novel, and that is to go to an intense moment and explore that moment. And of course, the most intense moment that came to me was the day that my father died. So I wrote this essay about the day my father died as a way of getting at the larger issue of what it means to live in a community like 
Mexico and Rumford, or Lewiston and Auburn, or a lot of other places I have since discovered. You don't have to be from a small town to have that bread in the bone feeling. In fact, people from Manhattan are the worst offenders. They think there's no place like Manhattan. And they're probably right, because that's where they were formed. So these places that mean so much to us, they, they come in all kinds of um, guises. So I wrote the essay, and I really enjoyed writing it. I had a good time and thought, wow, this is I, more fun than I thought it was going to be. I sent him the essay, and that was that. And then about two years later, I was um, kind of scouting around for material. I was sort of stuck, to tell you the truth, not in a great place professionally. And I was in kind of um, despair, I would have to say. Sometimes writers go through this, this, these processes. And my instinct was to go home. But I couldn't go home physically at that time. So I went home metaphorically, and I started writing a little bit more. I had always wanted to write about my older sister, Anne. So I started what I thought was going to be a companion essay, another separate essay that was sort of related to the first one, but not, not really. And I got about halfway through that and realized, of course, it was all part of a larger thing. So about a year passed. I wrote uh, uh, every day on this book. and. Uh, I had a draft at the end of the year, so I sent it to my younger sister, Kathy, who, if you've read the book, you know who she is. She's a year younger than I am, and she's not normally my first reader. I usually go to my sister, Anne, and my husband, Dan, who's in here tonight, big surprise, um, drove up from Portland. Uh, and so normally I do that because Dan will tell me the truth, and Anne will say, her idea of criticizing my work is to say, you know, this sentence right here is not as pristinely beautiful as the one that preceded it. <laughs> so we all need that kind of criticism as well in our lives. But Kathy, um, she usually likes to wait until the book comes out. She says, I don't, I don't want to read it beforehand. I want to be surprised just like any other reader. So all of my novels she has read as they came out, just as any other reader would. But I said, well, you have to read this because you're in it. Everybody who's in it has to read it first. So she said, okay, I'll read it. Then she took about, oh, a suspiciously long time getting back to me on the book. So I thought, uh-oh. So I called her about two weeks later. I said, so Kathy, what did you think of the manuscript? Because I was ready to send it out to my agent and kind of get it out of my hair and let it go. She said, well, you know, I liked this and I liked that and this part was good. And I said, well, but overall, what was your impression? This is her exact quote, which she will deny to her dying day. She said, you know, Mon, I'm in this, and I don't even think it's that interesting. <laughs> so we had a long conversation about this, and it turned out that she was absolutely right. It really was boring, because what I had done is used an essay voice, a journalist voice, for the whole book. For one essay, it worked perfectly fine, because I was talking about one incident, a town, some kind of thematic things around that uh, incident. But for a whole book that you want to invite a reader into, that journalistic voice just was not working. So I took the manuscript back, I sat on it for a couple of weeks and thought, okay, how am I going to do this? So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit here about process. Um, first of all, just for those of you who haven't read the book, as Clayton said, it, it, it's 1963 into 1964. It follows the Wood family through our first fatherless year. The other thing that's happening besides the Kennedy assassination, which did resonate very personally inside my household, because we had also just lost a beloved father and husband, just like that. And my mother, of course, worshipped the Kennedys because she was Catholic. Um, and, uh, but the other thing that was happening in the town at the same time was that the two towns were bracing for a protracted labor strike that would change the relationship between the town and the mill forevermore. So those three threads are kind of weaving through the story. The main story is of the family, but there are these other two outside things that are weaving through at the same time. So I thought, how am I going to get all of this material together? How am I going to do it to find the right way to write it? Because the way I chose, apparently, is really boring. So the first thing I did was I gave myself permission, as if I were a novelist, which I am, 
to treat my real life characters as if they were fictional characters in the sense that I could see the world through their eyes. Because what my sister had told me was, I feel like I'm looking at the story through a pane of glass. And it's because I had done everything at arm's length. Partly I think I might have been protecting myself from some of the sadness in the story, but I think more to the point, there were a lot of, um, I call them big fat liar memoirs that were coming out at the same time, that like James Fry and that crowd, who were telling these crazy stories that turned out to be completely fabricated. And I think I was so afraid that I would be accused of fiddling around with the truth in some way uh, that I, w I erred on the other side. Like it was just all, almost a piece of journalism. So I gave myself permission to say, OK, I have these characters who are real, but I'm going to treat them the way I would treat my novelistic characters by perceiving the world through their eyes, giving myself permission to inhabit them for the time that they're on the page. And the first place I went back to was a passage early in the book where the reader is following my father on his last mortal moments on earth. So I'm going to read this passage to you, and what I want you to listen for is the novelist writing. What, in a scene in a novel, what you try to do is you try to anchor the reader to the present moment even if it's a long past moment. So you want them to feel the past as if it were an unfolding now. So you keep the reader very, very anchored to that, whatever is happening at the time. But at the same time, you are trying to fold in, kind of sneak in a lot of facts and uh, things that you want the reader to know about the character and about the setting and the larger um, world that the character inhabits. So in other words, this one is, you know, it's a small town, it's an immigrant town, there's people with all kinds of different last names. The, the character works in the mill, he has five children, he came from Prince Edward Island. And that's kind of how I said it in the first draft, which I describe as it read like an appliance manual. So in this draft, what I tried to do is make it more story-like. So this is what I did. So I, what I want you to listen for is how you're anchored to the moment, but you're also getting a lot of information about my father and the town and my family. Okay. Dad, like most people, must have applied a kind of rhythm to his work day. I followed that rhythm in my mind many times after that morning, his feet hitting the floor upon waking, the morning ablutions, the soft exchanges with my mother as she hands him his lunch pail and clears his breakfast plate, the door clicking shut behind him, the three downward flights. And you notice how I just slipped into the present tense there? Who noticed? See, it very clever. I did this very cleverly. <clears throat> Possibly he stops to pet the Norcus's cat, Tootsie. Like all men in our family, Dad is a cat man, before stepping into the street. Perhaps he is in pain. I hope not. Even so, his last mortal moments are swaddled by the familiar. He leaves us, turns right onto Gleason Street, passes the O'Neills, the Gagnons, the Volushes, turns right again at Miss Caliendo's onto Mexico Avenue to the Venskis block, where they rent out their row of six attached garages at the back of the wide, black-topped driveway. Perhaps he stops here for a moment, gazing down that long, paved drive, for at times he still deeply misses the furrowed fields and quilted hills of Prince Edward Island, Canada, and the siblings who remain on the family farm. Is this crisp April morning one of those times? It's cold, but the air contains the coming spring. So yes, he stops, right here at the head of the driveway, hanging onto the post to take it in. He doesn't yet know he's running out of breath. He thinks it's memory doing this, the memory of the long dirt lane to the homestead he left at age 20. The farmhouse with its blistered roof, the pumped water, the lilacs and hollyhocks, the neighborhood of colorful characters who live along the road. It must be memory doing this, squeezing his chest, summoning an anointed place that could not give him what he found here, steady, decent, good paying work. He found his wife here, had five children over 20 years. Is he thinking of us now? He lets go of the post, steps onto the blacktop, walks slow, so slow, to the garage door, intending with all his heart to put in another blessed day of a life he never dreamed possible. 
In another eight years, he can retire, this man who has never taken a vacation or owned a house. Does he think of this as he reaches for the handle? Can he picture long visits back to the island, then endless, easeful days back here, tilling the borrowed plot he keeps in his father-in-law's yard, just a few houses up the street from where he stands now, tight-chested, filling with memory, at 6 o'clock in the morning, April 25th, 1963, in the first waking of an ordinary day. Here we go, people say at these humdrum moments of repetition, the day's momentum released by the turn of a key or the punch of a time card, or in Dad's case, the sliding open of a garage door. The door makes a loud, sacrilegious clang against the morning quiet. Here, a bursting in his chest. He drops his lunch pail, sees a flash of light, thinks of us in our innocent beds, and he's gone. I hope he had a moment of purity, a clearing of all thought and memory, a beautiful surrender. Dad was a Catholic who believed in the saints. I hope he saw the face of God. So that was the first place I went back to, and I realized that it was okay to treat my real life people as I would treat my novel characters because it allowed the reader much farther into the story than I could ever allow them through that pane of glass. Um, now the other thing is that um, I had that all set and I thought the other thing that I needed to deal with was voice. And voice in memoir, a childhood memoir especially, is very, very tricky. It's a lot harder than it looks. And it took me forever to get it right. And even in revision, I was going from sentence to sentence to sentence to word, 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 thinking, okay, is it this word or that word? Is this this syntax or that syntax? Just very exacting revision for something like this. And what I finally um, settled on was something that I call a braided voice. So I didn't want to use a nine-year-old's voice because a nine-year-old has a limited vocabulary and limited insight and limited knowledge. But I also didn't want to write it as only the adult, wise, older writer person because that was the kind of arm's length pane of glass voice. So what I ended up doing is trying to braid those two voices by using my writer's vocabulary but channeling the child's experience at the same time. And it was easier to do this by, again, it's a novelist's trick, is to render all of the passages through scene. So every scene in the book has its own beginning, middle, and end. So you feel like you've gone on a little journey in each scene and then each chapter. So I'm going to read one scene to you. And it's the scene that happens on the day that Kennedy is killed. And we're at choir practice at St. Teresa's School, which is the Catholic elementary school I went to with the Sisters of saint Chrétien. And uh, to the horror of my Irish family, we spoke French at the school a lot. Sorry, Kirk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to read this scene. And what I want you to listen for here is for that braided voice, how you are in the child's world, but at the same time, there's an adult sensibility kind of woven through it. It's, um, you kind of know it when you hear it. It's very hard to describe. So here it is. An hour before Oswald pulls the trigger, I'm at choir practice, knuckling under the tutelage of Sister Louise, a lean, starchy woman who means business and means it now. For a goodly portion of our lunch hour every day, we stand in the choir loft, straight-shouldered and ladylike, singing into the rich echo chamber of the empty church, learning to sight read and harmonize and project, project, project. Sister Louise sounds out all the parts. Not a good voice, though her pitch is flawless, her directing eminently followable. We keep our eyes on her long, lolloping fingers. The hands stop, shutting us up on the instant. Who laughed? Sister Louise swivels her flushing face from the altos to the soprano twos to the high sopranos and back again, the scorching heat of her gaze liquefying the innocent and guilty alike. I said, who laughed? I exchange a sidelong glance with Denise, who stands beside me with the soprano twos, and another with Kathy over there with the altos. 
We know from experience that Sister Louise can hold out longer than Methuselah. She can keep us through the end of the school day if she takes a notion, through supper, through the night, through the feast day of St. Blaise, 73 days hence. Our skin will rot away, our hair fall out from starvation, we will petrify ourselves into a choir of singing skeletons, our uniforms gone to rags, and still she'll be there, arms crossed, waiting for the malefactor to confess. <coughs> and so, I did, sister, Linda Cody, sixth grade, possessor of enviably long blonde hair and apparently a sizable death wish. <coughs> Why were you laughing? No reason, sister. People don't laugh for no reason. Well, it sounded kind of funny when your voice cracked. As Carolyn Keene, author of Nancy Drew, would have it, they froze in horror. <laughs> and you thought that was funny? Yes, sister. No choice here, she has to tell the truth. Is that so? then perhaps you would do us all the great favor of singing these lines yourself. Cue the organ. Sister Mary of Jesus, kindly, mustachioed, outranked, staring helplessly at the sheet music. A brief intro, slow and funereal. Then Linda sings four bars like a springtime sun. Tantum ergo sacramentum Venere morter nui. Uh-oh. Well, students, was that funny? Linda, did you hear anybody laughing while you sang? No. No? No, sister. Wherever Sister Louise might have been going with this, she appears to have lost her way. Perhaps she's been blindsided by the eerie joy of a young girl's clarity of tone or by the revelation that she, Sister Louise, has created a thing of beauty out of a mixed crew of schoolgirls who came to her with zero musical chops and wound up singing like the cherubim and seraphim. She teaches school because she has to. She directs the choir because she loves to. Her choir, our choir, is good. We've been told by Sister herself that we channel the sweetness of heaven. All right then, she says, glaring briefly at Linda, then at Sister Mary of Jesus, pretending she's nailed down her murky point. Now, everyone, from the first measure. She lifts her hands, thumbs and index finger, lightly touching. And remember, please, music is prayer. We're rehearsing for the season's high masses, Latin prayers like O Salutaris and Panis Angelicus and Ave Maria and varying arrangements of the Tantum Ergo. Though Sister Louise tosses Pope John a few crumbs like Holy God, we praise thy name, we remain among the last congregants in the country to succumb to the retooled protocols of Vatican II. It seems that every new thing in America comes late to our town. Rock and roll, collective bargaining, vinyl siding, the English language mass. But the news of the president reaches us fast, the same way it reaches everyone. Somebody hears the radio, turns on the TV, calls everyone she knows. I'm lined up with the rest of the fifth graders in the side lot after recess, waiting to return to our steam-heated classroom. All at once, Sister Bernadette bursts from the building, her small eyes rodent red with turmoil. Children, she says, a terrible thing has happened. Her doughy wrists jut from her cuffs and she hugs herself. She's forgotten her coat, a tiered woolen monstrosity that weighs 30 pounds. Her mouth opens to the cold. Oh no. Waiting in the crackled November sunshine, I can think of only one terrible thing. My body feels like a river in the act of freezing. On the other side of the building, the third graders in line after their own recess, Sister Louise whispers something to Sister Mary of Jesus, who blanches while Sister Louise faces the line and says, children, I have very bad news. Betty waits, docile and unmoved. Everything about school is bad news to her. 
But Kathy, who writes letters to mom when she's supposed to be practicing her times threes, jumps to the same numbing conclusion. Mom died. But it's not mom. Who, I whisper to Denise, who did she say? First I don't hear, then I do. It's President Kennedy, mom's other man. He has been shot. The president's dead, shouts a kid in line, one of the histrionic boys. There's going to be a war. Who cares? Kathy and I are possibly the only two citizens of the United States of America who received the heart-jangling, era-shaping news of 12.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, November 22nd, 1963, with a gulping wallop of relief. Mom is home, making a salmon loaf for our no-meat Friday supper, alive, alive, alive. So that was the second place that I went back to for the book. And from there, once I had the voice of the book, I felt like I had the book. And after that, I wrote it again for another year. I spent another year on the second draft. And I sent that draft to my sister Kathy. And this time, her exact quote was, now it feels true, which was so ironic when I thought I needed all these journalism skills to do this book, when really it was the skills I already had as a novelist that served me the best in writing a family story. One of the things that has uh, completely blindsided me about this book is I wrote it, it's probably the first thing I had written in 25 years that I wrote without thinking about eventual publication. I was really writing it only for myself and it was a liberating, wonderful feeling to be in that place because I hadn't been there in a really long time. And I didn't think that it would have any resonance at all beyond the borders of Oxford County, maybe Franklin County, and I could not have been more wrong. And what I realized traveling around with this book for the last almost year and a half is that any family story is everybody's family story in some way. And the thing that has astonished me is how many doors there are to open in anybody's family story. So for this one, the mail I get is things like, well, I also grew up Catholic, or, oh, I remember the Kennedy era, or um, we also had a handicapped sibling in our family, or I also had an early loss, or we worked in a factory town. We made shoes, we made buttons, we made shirts, we made car parts, we're an oil town, a steel town. Uh, I was in Detroit last week, and I was just astonished at how much they connected to this family story, because it's in part about the beginning of the end of American supremacy in manufacturing. And so many towns have felt that loss, that huge loss of the um, lifeblood of a community, which is the factory that moves overseas or that closes down. And a lot of the letters I have received have been about that. Um, there's another story I do want to tell. I, I, okay. And um, it's, uh, again, it's about family stories being so universal in very unexpected ways. So I was in Austin, Texas last summer, and it was one of those weeks where uh, on Tuesday I was in Santa Rosa, California, on Wednesday I was in Washington, D.C., and on Thursday I flew to Austin. So I'm getting there, and, you know, the first line of this book is, in Mexico, Maine, where I grew up, you couldn't find a single Mexican. And uh, I'm literally walking up to the podium, and it was at St. Edward's University, which is a Catholic college in Austin, Texas. And I'm looking out at the audience. Half of them are first-generation Mexican-American students. And I'm walking up with my book thinking, oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm near the real Mexico here. And it had not even occurred to me until I got there. So I thought, all right, well, you know, let's see how it goes over. So I read that first line, and everybody just cracked up. And then there's a line a few lines later, and it reads something like, in fourth grade, when I discovered that the world contained a country called Mexico, I spent several befuzzled days wondering why it had named itself after us. <laughs> and they thought this was the funniest thing they had ever heard. <clears throat> so there they are, and I continue reading the prologue. And for those of you who have read the prologue, you know that it's about um, how an immigrant town is made and how the, my parents and so many others' parents and grandparents came to places like Rumford in Mexico 
for the jobs to lay down a dream path for their children to walk away on. And as I read this, the place got quieter and quieter and quieter. And I realized it was one of those kind of goosebump moments that even though my story that I was telling happened 50 years ago, which is just a number that sets my hair on fire, it was absolutely their story now in 2013. It was just absolutely astonishing. And afterwards, a lot of the students came up and, and talked to me about their experience. And someone said, you know, that, that book sounds, one of them said, you know, um, at first I thought, you know, she's really old, but <laughs> I, I think I could really relate to your story. It was just very, very sweet. Um, these are 19, 20-year-old students, um, and I've met students here on campus today who have told me, this, not that I, I'm old, but they very politely <laughs> told me that they connected and related to this story that took place, you know, long before they were ever born. And so there is something about telling a family story that opens you up to people in a completely unique way that has been enormously gratifying to me. So one of the things that I have been saying on the road from coast to coast is for those of you thinking about writing your family stories or maybe you've made a few notes here and there, please do it. Because if you do not preserve your family story, it will die with you. And life sometimes is shorter than we think it's going to be. And if you don't write your story, somebody else is going to write it for you or it will never get written at all. And that is something that would be a, a really a tragedy. You know, living history, this is, this is our history. Right now we're living it. And if we want someone to remember it, we need to, to write those things down. And the other thing I love to tell people is to please support your local historical society. I owe a great debt to the one in Rumford. Um, because it's open every Thursday from 11 to 1. And so an entire winter and spring, I drove up there every single Thursday. And the place is probably, well, quite a bit smaller than this stage. And it's run by two lovely older ladies. And I think probably every historical society in America is run by two lovely older ladies. <laughs> And the archives they had in there, just an absolute treasure trove. A lot of old photographs of the mill that would curl your hair, um, pictures of men <clears throat> in the 20s barefoot in the mill with their shirt tails hanging out, you know, not a hard hat in sight. There's no OSHA, there's no anything. Standing over vats of open acid. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing to see the history in photographs as well. Old journals, diaries. Um, I read many, many, many old issues of the Rumford Falls Times that is a chronicle of the town of Rumford in Mexico. And uh, so it was just a wonderful feeling to be in that place. And I really make it a point to support that historical society, because not just because it helped me, but it is preserving, as all of these historical societies do, is preserving the story of us, which is an important story, as I have discovered by writing my own. Are we okay? All right. Thank you all so very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We do have time for me to take one or two questions. If anybody is dying to ask something, I would love to. It's sort of, can't really quite see out there, but if anybody has a question you'd like to ask, I'm all ears. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, we all know that the, um, the expression, the fog of war, where you don't quite, quite remember, is there such a thing as the fog of novel? Well, there's certainly such a thing as the fog of memoir, because anybody with a sibling knows that memory is very slippery, and that what you might remember, a sibling remembers very, very differently. And so the way I approached this was um, that all I could do was tell the reader as honestly as I could the truth as I remember it. So I didn't make anything up. There are no composite characters. I didn't fiddle around with chronology. I changed one name, and that was all. 
Uh, and it's, it's as, as close as I can get to the truth. The only thing I know for sure is in here that is inaccurate, my sisters informed me about this, is there's a blizzard in one of the chapters, and it's a big part of the chapter. It's our trip to Washington, D.C. after the assassination. And I remember it as this blizzard we pulled off the road. It was our first time staying in a motel. It was a really big deal. And when my sisters read the draft, they said, there was no, we didn't, you're thinking of that other trip we took to blah, blah. And I said, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. And of course, with siblings, you always think you're the one who remembers it correctly. Well, with Google, of course, you can look up anything. So I said, well, I'm looking up weather for that. I'm going to tell you right now. So I clickety click, click. And I was astonished to find not only no snow, but no weather to speak of, no rain, nothing. It was a beautiful, beautiful week. So I said, oh my goodness, now what do I do? And my older sister, who was my high school English teacher, by the way, and who, to whom I turned for all things that uh, moral and otherwise, I said, what do I do? I know this is inaccurate, but it's how I remember it. And she said, if that's how you remember it, that's how you tell it, so you keep it in. So I did keep it in. I felt a little bit guilty about it, so I actually wrote an author's note at the beginning to say, I know that wasn't really a blizzard, but that's just how it, it, it still exists in my mind that way. But thank you for your question. Somebody else? Yes? Somebody over here? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, the question is about the Catholic faith in my book, and the nuns in particular, and uh, was I trying to nail the sisters, or was it kind of the kid's point of view? And it's, yes, of course, it's a, from a child's point of view, the nuns were larger than life. But I, and I think it's a very affectionate portrait of the nuns in my uh, book, because I do feel very grateful and um, a great deal of affection for my Catholic upbringing. I wouldn't call myself religious now, but I feel very grateful to have been raised in, a, in the Catholic religious tradition, very much so. And I have to say, the nuns, you know, I, I went to Georgetown University, which is this big fancy school, but by the time I got there, I believe I had all the writing training I would need to be a lifelong writer. The nuns at St. Teresa's School were so brilliant and so good and so exacting. Uh, and we diagrammed sentences, remember that? Some of us are old enough to remember that. And they just taught me to love the architecture of my mother tongue, and I have been eternally grateful for them. And I also had some marvelous teachers in, in high school as well. In fact, I, I met the grandson of one of them goes to school here at Bates, which was just incredibly cool. So thank you for your question. Maybe one more before we go? Anybody has one? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is about my sister Betty, who some of you know from the book, and um, how she's doing now. Betty is now 63 years old. She's doing just fine and dandy, thank you. Um, that's still kind of a larger-than-life character. I would probably still write her dialogue in capital letters if I were writing about her now. Uh, I'll just tell you a quick Betty story. This is Betty all over. She, well, for one thing, I'm the giant of my family. My sisters all come up to about here on me. And uh, Betty is about four feet 10. She weighs 82 pounds, and uh, she's larger than life. And uh, so she also has an idol, which is Kim Block, the anchor woman in Maine, Channel 13. Some of you may have read this essay. 
that I wrote. Um, and so she has been watching the news every single night for 30 years, and Kim has been broadcasting the news every night for 30 years. And so I wrote a little piece on Betty's worship of Kim Block and how Betty kind of uh, takes all her cues from Kim, like if Kim says it's bad to talk on a cell phone, that's all you hear for months is, look at that person on a cell phone. You say, well, Betty, it's okay, they're not driving. Well, but they're not even in a car. It's okay, that's fine. <laughs> so Maine being Maine, very small, I have a friend who's a very good friend of Kim Block. So I um, had Betty as a big surprise, she was going to go over to the studio and visit Kim. So we get the VIP treatment, and we sat on this little couch and watched the new news, which Kim was broadcasting. Now, Betty watches the news in a very emotional fashion. And unfortunately for me, that day, there was a hurricane coming up the coast, there was a propane fire in South Portland, and there was an earthquake somewhere. So we're sitting down, and Kim comes in the studio, and she says, now, when that green light goes on, you have to... I said, okay, Bet, you can't emote. No emoting. Just, just sit there and watch the news. And it probably would have been fine if she had seen just Kim, but Kim was there, and then the monitor was here. So you can see all of the graphics. So in our lead story, an earthquake, and you see a tree falling on a school bus. And Betty goes, ah! And so I said, oh, she's okay, it's okay. And in another, a propane fire in Portland, you can see sky licking flames, and she's, ah! <clears throat> so finally, we get through the news, and fortunately, they were in the football scores, and she has no interest at all in that. And so, the finally ended and the other light came on. I said, okay, Bet, you can go up and say hello to Kim. So she goes barreling up to the anchor desk and she says, hear this, Kim Block, there was a hurricane. <laughs> so that's Betty all over. Just, uh, she's just a, a delightful person. And, and I should say, you know, all my siblings who can read read the book before it came out. And with, with Betty, I read to her all the parts that she was in and she approved everything. So, didn't ask me to change a thing. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all so much for your time, and um, I hope we can all get back for maybe the bottom of the fifth, say? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I will. And also, um, I will be signing books, I guess, right up outside the door at the table there. So if you want a book signed or you want to chat, I would love to see you. Okay, thanks. <laughs>